right, welcome back. Today's lesson is all about uh, the flame test, about emission spectra, and then what sort of information we can find out about different elements uh, by using emission spectra and flame tests, including going beyond chemistry a little bit. What are some of the kind of big discoveries that we've done using this particular sort of experimental method? So um, I'm going to do a little bit of review, basically, on what emission spectra are, and then we'll go into more about kind of what do you need to be looking for as we're doing a flame test, because, you know, flame test, right? Fire. It's the best lab of the year. So what's an emission spectrum? Uh, keep in mind that when we're talking about energy and when we're talking about atoms, that if we run a bunch of energy into an atom, it's going to absorb that energy and then release that energy. It never stays just inside. And when it releases energy, a lot of times it's released in the form of light. Sometimes it's released in the form of heat or other things that we don't see. But what we really care about in this lesson is the light that's being produced. So how do they absorb at it? Well, they absorb electricity in a couple of different ways. Uh, the one that we looked at in class uh, was that we took little tubes of gas, we hooked them up to a high voltage source and run a bunch of electricity through there. And that works great for things that are already in a gaseous state, uh, where you can get the, the gas sort of to glow, it kind of forms like a plasma, and you get these beautiful lights, kind of like this uh, nice red neon light that's over here, this classic red uh, that we see from these things. And if you drive around town, especially at night, you'll see plenty of old cool neon lights that take advantage of this glass tube, gas, and high voltage source situation. They get super hot, uh, but they look really, really cool. Uh, and each uh, particular element that you put in those tubes gives off its own unique color, so you can make kind of cool signs uh, related to that. But our more favorite way, at least my more favorite way, more fun way, set them on fire, right? Yeah, fire. Um, you've seen this. It's called fireworks. Uh, but fire works great for certain kinds of solids, where you can put some energy to it in terms of fire, flame, um, and get it to react somehow, either react with the oxygen or some other things that are nearby, and get it to release energy in that form. Um, and again, that's just that's just fun. So, you know, why not, right? Um, and that works, again, for things that are solids, or sometimes we can uh, dissolve them. Uh, we're going to use solids and just put little solid pieces in there and let them burn. Um, but you can also sometimes dissolve them in types of alcohols and have burning kinds of flames uh, that are burning from the alcohol itself when it starts on fire. So the, both of those are pretty cool. So keep in mind the big picture here is what's happening in both of these situations is that we're getting electrons inside these atoms, and there are trillions of them. There's so many different electrons that are present in all of these different atoms that each of those little electrons are almost like little popcorn. I think of them like they're all sort of absorbing and releasing and absorbing and releasing and absorbing and releasing kind of all over the place. We as huge creatures that we are see it as sort of one continuous emission of light, but it's not. It's actually, you know, a trillion little tiny sparkles of light being emitted by each one of these individual little electrons as they're doing their thing. So we can't see it when it's absorbing energy. That's not the part that we see. That's energy going in, and that's causing those electrons to bump up. What we see is the opposite, when they drop back down. And when they're dropping back down to that ground state, they're releasing that energy. They're sort of going, ah. Oh. And it's that part that we see that's given off to us in the form of light. The light that we care about, it's actually electromagnetic uh, radiation, all of it. Um, but the, care, the stuff that we care about is the visible light. Yes, there's going to be um, a variety of electromagnetic radiation produced in ultraviolet or in infrared. Um, and we can detect those with computers. But uh, as far as we're concerned, we really care about that visible light, that really narrow range of wavelengths that happens to be detectable by our lovely eyeballs. So in terms of what this looks like, there's a relationship between the color of light and the amount of energy that was absorbed and then released. And this is kind of the big idea that you need to take away from this whole process, is that the electrons are going to jump up to high energy, and if they're only falling down a small bit, um, there's a relationship. The small bit, like this one right here, where it's a small one-step drop, that's going to be a relatively low energy uh, amount of energy that's being emitted. And remember from our electromagnetic spectrum is that the low energy side of the EM spectrum is the red side, red and infrared and radio waves and all those down there. As we start to increase the size of the drop, we're increasing the amount of energy, and we're going to transition from red towards the higher end, which would be into the yellow and then the green and then into the light blue. Um, as the drop gets bigger, we're going to get different colors of light that are produced. And we get really big drops of light, like this would be a three-story drop here. Um, we're going to get into the blue to the violet. And if it's even bigger than that, it's actually going to be released in ultraviolet. We just can't see that uh, with our eyes, but it's there, um, and we can detect it with uh, certain types of cameras and things like that. So again, a bigger drop, a bigger you know, change in energy is going to create light that's more on the blue-violet end of the spectrum, and lower wavelength drops or lower drops are going to be on that red-orange kind of end of the spectrum. Again, key idea. There's a direct relationship between energy and color. 
So with hydrogen's emission spectrum, we took a look at this one in class. Um, again, hydrogen's only got one electron, so this is the one that gets studied really often uh, because it's an easy one to see. And so this is the relationship between what this one little electron is doing in there. Remember, hydrogen's a really simple atom, one proton, one electron. So this one electron is kind of bouncing around. Sometimes it jumps up one energy level, and it drops one energy level, and that's produced in the red light. And that's that bright red line spectrum that we saw right here, and it's the brightest of all the spectrum. Sometimes it's actually going to be a little bit of a bigger jump. It's going to be two energy levels, and this is going to be the sort of bluish, greenish kind of color that's in the middle here. Sometimes it's a three energy level or a four energy level drop, um, and those are going to be the ones that are released over into this range, that blue to purple piece. Um, these observations, the calculations that they made about, okay, if it's dropping from level three to level two, it's going to give off this much energy. This corresponded perfectly to Bohr's mathematical calculations and really gave uh, a great bit of, of credence to his idea of energy levels, an idea that we still use today. Um, we've had to do some kind of tweaking to that model uh, to make it a little bit better for bigger atoms, but um, it worked really well. And again, all of his calculations worked out pretty well. We know that that's the relationship between those little bars of light are due to the action of individual electrons that are jumping energy levels and dropping um, energy levels dropping back down. So when we start taking a look at other types of elements, there's hydrogen again at the top, here's a range of other elements that are on there just to kind of give you some ideas. We looked at some of these in class uh, and then some of these we haven't seen yet, uh, but all of them have their own unique set of lines as all of their different electrons are jumping up, one energy level, two, three, dropping in between. We see different patterns for each element. Each atom has a unique set of energy levels and a unique bunch of electrons that's jumping around in there. And so we can use these emission spectrum as types of fingerprints. They're all unique. Every atom has its own thing. Now, it doesn't necessarily relate it to the number of lines and how complex it is. So for example, neon is um, atomic number 10 and sodium is atomic number 11. The number of lines is not related to how big or how complex the atom is. It's more of how many lines by chance happen to be visible to us. Uh, and again, sodium happens to only have three lines that are produced in the visible spectrum to us, whereas neon has a whole bunch of lines, a lot of them are red, that are produced in that visible spectrum to us. So don't just think that a more complex pattern is a more complex atom, because that's not true. Um, keep in mind also that even for uh, elements as complex as helium with two whole electrons, Bohr's simple model didn't quite work out. And so again, after Bohr did his first one in hydrogen, and yay, I figured everything out, uh, as soon as they started studying other elements, like, oh, no, not as good as I thought. Well, darn it. They went back and revised it. We'll talk about the revisions here like next. Uh, basically, the idea that these energy levels aren't single levels, they're sub-levels, and they're subdivided, things like that. So we'll get there in a couple of days. Okay, more fun for us, rather than just doing emission tubes, which is kind of fun, and yeah, okay, you can see them from a distance, let's set stuff on fire. It turns out that just like each tube that we saw had its own unique color, each flame that's produced has its own unique color as well. And you can see sort of a representative example of some of the ones that we'll be doing. We're not going to do all of these particular salts because some of these are actually quite toxic um, when they're burning, so we're not going to do all these. We'll do the safer ones. Uh, it's not super safe, but we'll do the safer ones that aren't going to cause you like cancer right now. Um, but every single flame has a fairly unique color. Even just looking at it, they're kind of similar or kind of different. Uh, some of them are close, like you look at rubidium and cesium right here, and even potassium. They're all sort of purpley. It's kind of hard for us to tell the difference. And even like sodium and calcium, I'll talk about these here, have very similar colors. They're both sort of a bright yellowish orange. So with all of these, they are unique, and some of them you can tell very obviously, some of them you can't quite. Keep in mind that with all of these, we're going to use salts, um, so like um, lithium chloride and sodium chloride and potassium chloride. Um, the anions, the things that they're with, um, we usually use ones that, that create um, ultraviolet light. So if we're burning sodium chloride, this color that we see here, this bright orange from sodium chloride, is due to the metal. It's the sodium that's releasing the wavelengths that are visible to us. The chlorine is also burning. It's also releasing wavelengths. It just happens to be that those wavelengths from anions tend to be ultraviolet. They're just beyond our range of vision, so they don't actually kind of cloud up what we're looking at. It makes it a lot easier for us to see just the metals. So again, the flame test works for metals is typically what we are going to use this for, not nonmetals. So here's a, kind of a representative example. When we look at these flames, not only can you see the different colors, but you can use those little, uh, the little uh, diffraction gratings, and you can actually do it and kind of split them out. 
With all of these, you're still gonna see that pattern of bright lines, although because we're creating a flame and flame generally kind of glows anyway, it's a little bit harder to pick out the lines than it was the ones that we saw in class. So they all tend to have the sort of glow in the background that you can see, that's just sort of the background color of the fire, but then you'll see these sort of different ranges of different metals, the different bright lines that are in there. And if you look kind of top to bottom, hit pause or whatever, you'll see that each one of these has its own unique sort of patterns. One of the ones that we see a lot is sodium. It's got this one single super bright yellow line and it's really easy to see. Um, some of these other ones like lithium, you can see there's kind of an orange and a red, and then there's something down here in the bluish. And then again, some of these are gonna have more lines and less lines, just like the gas ones that we saw. So look a little bit different, but they're still gonna be similar enough to what we've seen. One of the things that's important to know is that distinguishing elements by flame color alone um, is easy to do if the colors are really different, but if they're kind of similar like these two, which is sodium and calcium, um, it can be difficult to tell just by using your eyes. So that's where the combination of using the eye color, like, ooh, I can narrow it down to two choices now, and then you use your diffraction grating to look at the flame, then it becomes really easy to distinguish between the two of them. So for example, if I use a diffraction grating on this sort of yellowish orange flame, and I get just kind of a yellow line, I know that it's sodium. If I see a yellowish orange flame and look through the diffraction grating and I'm seeing stuff in the greens and blues and oranges as well, then that's gonna be calcium. So we kinda of use the combination of the two. The naked eyeball color, right, just the color of the flame, and then we use the, the, um, the diffraction gratings to help distinguish between ones that are very similar. And again, it kinda of helps us to kinda of really narrow in on which element is which. We can also do this with mixtures. One of the things I'm gonna have you guys do is I'm gonna create a couple of mixtures of two different elements and you're gonna to have to tell me what the two elements are. You're gonna to need to give me the evidence that shows me what they are. One of the cool things about when we do flame tests on mixtures is that each element produces its flame test or its um, emission spectrum at the same time. And they sort of overlap on top of one another. So in this little diagram that's on there, sorry, it's not in color, I couldn't find a good color one. Uh, but this one down at the bottom, here's our mixture and you see these kind of crazy lines down here. And if you know that this mixture down here is a mix of at least two of these elements up above it, all you have to do is match up the lines. So I can tell from these two lines right here, these two red lines, that it's probably going to contain strontium because strontium has really similar red lines and these two don't have anything at all like that. And if I look at the other lines, I can see that there's a pretty good match of those and then even going over here, there's some other matches that's on there. But there's some lines here, like this one, that's not found in strontium. So then I have to kind of look at the other ones. All right, so is it cadmium or lithium? Well, this line has a similar one in both of these. So it's not, I can't tell which one of those two it is. So then I have to look at some other lines. If I take a look over here at cadmium, at this one right here, or this one right here, I can see that there's no analog for them down in that mixture. That one's not there, and this one is also not down there. But lithium does have those same analogs. So it's got this one, and it traces down to that line right there, and that matches. And if I take a look at this one right here, these kind of match, and this one right here matches down in that last one right there. So again, that mixture is an overlap of the elements that make it up, so it's pretty easy to tell what's present in a mixture. Some other ways that flame tests have been used is actually kind of cool. There's some uh, extensions to this. We're going to talk about astronomy just a little bit because that's a lot of where this gets used. Uh, for example, um, when they looked at the, um, the sun, they discovered a new element. It sounds kind of funny to say that because the sun's huge. I mean, why would we discover a new element in the sun? But when they looked at the diffraction grating in the sun, they got this unique pattern to it, which has this sort of bright yellow line and then some blues and stuff like that. It's definitely not hydrogen. It's similar in some ways to hydrogen. And there's some lines in here that are like hydrogen, like this one and this one. But this bright yellow one right here is definitely not found in hydrogen spectrum. And that's what they were expecting to find. So as they studied it a little bit more, they realized they'd found a new element. And so they named that element helium after Helios, which is the name for the sun. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why they never found that until they looked at the sun. Like number one, you don't find helium on earth. It's too light. It floats out of our atmosphere. There's no source of helium on the surface. The only pockets of helium that we get are buried deep underground now that we know that this element exists. Um, and second of all, we don't find helium on Earth because it's a noble gas. It's unreactive. So it wouldn't be locked up in any of our rocks or anything along those lines uh, like some of our other elements are. And it turns out that the helium is actually being produced in the sun from a nuclear fusion reaction. You take a, a hydrogen and another hydrogen, each which have one proton, and you jam them together in the super high gravity of the, of the core of the sun, and you create the new element 
helium. And it turns out helium is actually incredibly common. Almost every single star that they looked at as soon as they realized what it was has helium as its second element. Hydrogen's the most common element in the universe, that simple, simple atom. But then the, the fused hydrogens form helium, and that's the second most common element. So it's kind of funny to think that the second most common element in the universe was hiding right in front of us, and it took them a very long time to actually discover it just because of that. And they discovered it using spectroscopy, this kind of idea of this um, flame test. Um, they also started to look at other types of stars, and when they started looking at other stars, they kind of create these interesting looking spectra like these, a little bit very different from the ones that we look at. There's sort of this kind of continuous spectrum with dark lines to it, and they realized as they're looking that this was actually giving them some categorization they could use to identify different types of stars, um, and not all the stars have the same pattern, so there's some definitely different things, even though all these stars are out there. Number one, they could figure out some things about temperature. They started to realize that certain stars were hot and certain stars were cooler. Um, and that's actually what you see on the left, that B-A-F-G-K-M. That's actually the sequence of stars from uh, coolest at the top to hottest at the bottom, I believe. Um, I might have said that backwards. Um, and they could also kind of detect certain elements were present. So like, they found like iron is present in certain stars way out distance just by looking at these things. So as they started to plot these things out, they realized that there was this big, long main sequence kind of stars, which is kind of cool, um, that we had this kind of range of stars as they were looking across the universe that tended to have this range from from very cool and bright to kind of warm and dim. And that's kind of this top up here is cool and bright. Luminosity is how bright it is. Um, and then this would be, oh, so not cool and bright, hot and bright. Sorry. Um, hot and bright over here, these blue ones, super bright, hot, white. And these ones over here, think about like a cool glowing metal, right? Sort of cool, but not very bright in terms of what, the, uh, what those are. Absolute magnitude is really kind of weird. Um, these are dim. Absolute magnitude being negative is actually brighter. I know it's backwards. I, I didn't make it up. It's not my fault. Blame the astronomers. And again, most of the stars kind of fell in this main sequence. Our sun is somewhere down in here somewhere. We're kind of in this main sequence piece. Um, then they discovered that as they're plotting this out, that there's a bunch of stars that don't fit in the main sequence. By far, most of them do. But there are these other weird classes, and they discovered this by using flame tests, or emission spectrum, basically. There's this group down here that's white. They're hot, but yet they're not very bright. And so they were called white dwarfs, because they seem to be very small, very dense, but hot stars. And then we've got this group up here, which is brighter than they should be. So they're red giants. They must be much larger than we thought. And then there's this group at the top, the super giants. Super huge. They must be absolutely absolutely enormous uh, to be able to produce the amount of light that they're producing at the temperatures they seem to be. So again, it's just some kind of cool things about figuring out more about how our universe works. That, yeah, even though we've got this very average looking little sun here in our universe, that there are these other crazy exotic things that are out there. Um, we also discovered, uh, through using the flame test or emission spectrum, that the universe is expanding. Um, that every way we look at the universe, the universe is traveling away from us. Uh, when we take a look at our sun, uh, these are absorption spectra. They're kind of a mirror image of emission spectrum. But we see these very similar lines. Like, here's that red line that we would see from hydrogen. Here's the yellow line that we see from helium. Here's that other bright blue line that we see from hydrogen. That's kind of what our sun produces. When we look at every other star that's mostly made of hydrogen and helium, because they're all fairly similar in that sense, we see a very similar pattern. The lines are basically the same order. We see like a double line and then a single, and there's this one and then this one. But all those lines are shifted to the right a little bit. This is called redshift. Um, it's actually a version of the Doppler effect. You've heard of the Doppler effect. When the siren goes past, it goes, yeah, right? You hear that increase in pitch and decrease in pitch. Well, this happens with light, too. Uh, and they found out that when light is moving towards you, it tends to increase its pitch or its frequency, which means it shifts towards blue. And if it's going away from you, it drops its pitch, drops its frequency, which means it shifts towards red. And we will look at every single star. This is crazy. Every star in the universe, no matter which direction we face, every one of them is moving away from us. Redshift. Doesn't mean we're the center of the universe. It means the universe is expanding. It's getting infinitely larger in every possible direction. We just happen to be a part of it. It's pretty mind-blowing, actually. All right. So in terms of the big ideas that we found today, back to the flame test, each element is its own unique atomic structure, and therefore, because it has its own unique arrangements of electrons and energy levels, each one creates its own unique emission spectrum. Again, how does this happen? Electrons are absorbing energy, and it's when they drop back down, they are releasing that energy as light that we can then detect. When it's a large drop, it's going to produce light that's in that violet to ultraviolet range, that end of the spectrum. When it's a lower energy drop, it's going to produce light that's in the red end of the spectrum. 
and then each one has its own unique pattern. So an emission spectrum is a type of atomic fingerprint or an elemental fingerprint, and you can identify elements just by looking at the emission spectrum exactly which lines they have. So for us, we're going to use flame tests as a way to identify different types of metals because metals respond very well to the flame test. Nonmetals do not. Nonmetals tend to produce in the ultraviolet that we can't see as well. Um, the emission spectrum that we do with gas tubes works very well for other types of elements like nonmetals especially. And we can use flame tests for mixtures. Keep in mind also, just for just sake of interest and just general awesomeness, that these emission spectra that we're looking at has some really cool applications for us understanding our universe, um, our world, our own sun, our star right next door to us, as well as sort of what's happening in the universe as a whole. So I hope you enjoyed that. Just some interesting things about flame tests and color and light that maybe you didn't know before. See you in lab tomorrow. We get to set stuff on fire.